So go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21 if you have it. Um, I have never heard this parable preached. And when I was looking for parables to go through, I hit this one and thought, huh, why is no one, why does no preacher ever preach this one? And so I went through, I studied it for hours, think, going through all the layers of meaning and the history of it, and it's just as simple as it sounds. It really is. Um, there are no layers of meaning to be found. It really is quite simple. So Matthew chapter 21, verse 28. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I won't, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir, just as soon as I finish my video games. But he didn't go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. It's a very simple parable. And it really is amazing to me that Jesus is saying to people in the temple who are saying to him, by whose authority do you do, you do this? By whose authority do you teach? Do you have the proper degree to be teaching all this? Do you really know what you're talking about? Isn't it obvious whether or not I know what I'm talking about? Can't you tell by the message? The prostitutes and the tax collectors could, but you priests in the temple can't? I'm going to read this whole thing backwards, by the way, because Matthew, I think, tells stories back to front. He gives you the explanation, and then he tells you a story about what he just said. But I think... The story needs some explanation. You see, Jesus was in the temple in verse 23. And while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? What things is he doing? He's talking about God? He's healing people? What authority does he need to do that? What authority do I need to tell you about God? What authority do you need to tell others about God? And who gave you this authority? In other words, did you go to a proper seminary? I didn't see you there. Are you a Levite? You're supposed to be of a certain family if you're going to be a priest, you know. Jesus replied, I'll ask you one question. And if you answer me, I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. You know I love sassy Jesus. Sassy Jesus really is my favorite Jesus. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or a human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he'll then ask, Then why didn't you believe it? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. And Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. In other words, if you take your authority from a seminar, if you take your authority from fantastic education and your priestly robes, but you can't answer a simple question like that, then what good did it do you? What did you really learn in seminary? Did you learn to recognize the word of God? Well, then why didn't you see when a prophet was preaching to you? But it speaks to more than that. If our hearts aren't open to God's word, then even when we see it, 
even when we see God moving out in the world, we can't recognize it. What if we see someone, not from our knowledge, not from our sense, spreading the word of God and making a huge difference in people's lives? What if their word is different from ours? What if their understanding of the scripture is different from ours? But we see it changing lives. Doesn't matter what their specific theology is. Doesn't matter whether they went with the right seminary. Doesn't matter whether or not they learned from the right teachers. All that really matters is that God is moving in our lives. We're going to keep going backwards because you notice that the Pharisees here, the teachers of the law, they say two things to one another. If we say this, he'll say that. If we say this, he'll say this other thing. They're hypocrites. They're two-faced. Their answer depends on what they want to get out of the people whose question they're answering. Well, before this, we see Jesus perform a miracle where he curses a hypocritical fig tree. Because when a fig tree grows leaves, it's already started to bud its fruit. Early in the morning, as Jesus went on his way to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, that you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. And when his disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, well, go throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. What did the mountain do to Jesus? If you believe and receive whatever you ask for in prayer. But that's the thing. Why does Jesus curse the fig tree? Because it has no figs. It's advertising. It has leaves. It's saying, I have figs. There's fruit. Come, eat my fruit. Sit under my shade. And all it has is shade to grow. Just like the Pharisees. Finally, we have the passage that I didn't read earlier because I forgot about it. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Now you might wonder, why are there even money changers in the temple? What do they, why do they have to change the money? The Roman Empire has one currency, and it's the denarius. It's used everywhere. Although, since this is written in Greek, it's the denarius, and that's a Greek currency. You know, if I went to the right seminary. <laughs> but the Roman currency couldn't be used in the temple, and we're about to find out why. That's why the money changers were there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Now, why are the doves there? Why are people selling doves at all? The doves are there to be given the sacrifices. And the idea is, if you are too poor to bring a sacrificial lamb, if you are too poor to sacrifice an animal or anything else that you have, you can still catch a dove outside the temple and offer what you literally caught just outside the temple. What you got for free, you can offer it to God. No matter how poor you are. So this does, it represents that level of poverty. That level of, I have nothing to give. Why are they selling them? Jesus isn't saying, you can't give people the doves. He's saying you can't sell them. If they had money to buy a dove, they have money to give an offering. That's the hypocrisy of people selling doves in the temple. He says, 
he said to them, as it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. You're selling what should be free to the poor, and you're taking the money of people, and you're giving them a bad exchange rate for their money. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. By the way, who should be healing people at the temple? In Mark chapter 1, we see a man with leprosy come to Jesus. And Jesus heals them. And then he says to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. The priest is the one who should be performing these healings. Why is Jesus doing it? Because the priests aren't doing their job. So people are being ripped off. And when they get in with their offerings, the priests aren't even doing their jobs. Jesus is healing people at the temple. But when the chief priests and teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. After all, he's doing their job. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, O Lord, have called forth your praise. You know, children in church are never saying the things they're supposed to say. Quite often they're getting us in trouble, aren't they? Have you ever said something to a kid that you, you think, now, don't tell your parents this, but have you ever said anything like that to your kids? Now, don't tell anyone else this, but... And children just have a way of running at the mouth. They're saying, Hosanna to the Son of David, because Jesus has healed them, healed their parents, healed the people they love, their friends, themselves, their parents, their siblings. And of course, they're not going to keep quiet about it because they're kids. They say, Hosanna to the Son of David. The son of David is the Messiah. They praise him. They know he is their savior because he has brought healing. They came to the temple so that the priests could heal them. And when the priests couldn't, because they weren't doing the will of God, they said, what about that street preacher over there? The priests thought that based on their high standing, based on their education, based on, based on their privilege, that people should have to come to them. They have a monopoly. They have a monopoly on God's will, on healing, on deciding what is right and wrong in society. But when God sent his son, God broke that monopoly. He said, you don't get to decide what's right and wrong for other people. You don't get to decide, to decide who gets to enter the temple. You don't get to decide who has a voice and who doesn't. You don't get to decide who is good enough to sit in your pew, who is good enough to carry your offering plate and who is good enough to serve communion. Because I tell you the truth, if you aren't good enough to carry that communion basket or the offering basket or to give this sermon, then your church has a problem. It has, it has a problem of those who are in and those who are out. And the priests are saying to Jesus, we're the ones who are in. You're the ones who are out. And Jesus says, no. If you can't even recognize the word of God, but the, 
tax collectors and the prostitutes can, guess what? The tax collectors and the prostitutes are the ones that are going to be serving communion next week. Because they're the ones that God is finding worthy. They're the ones that God wants for his kingdom. Does God want someone who says, oh, of course, I'll go and work today, and doesn't? Priests that don't heal anyone or teach God's word? Or does he want someone who says, man, I really don't feel like doing this today, and then does it anyways? You know, when I was preparing this sermon, it was definitely the type of sermon that I felt like, man, I really don't feel like doing this today. I really don't feel like going to a parable with an obvious meaning. But I really feel like God is calling me to use this parable because I haven't heard it before. I've never heard it preached from a pulpit. So what word does God have from it? And I wonder... If God is calling us in the LGBTQ community, and if he's saying, I didn't call you at first. I called all these nice, straight churchgoers in their three-piece suits. But one day, people started showing up, and they weren't being taught the word of God. One day, people started showing up, and they weren't receiving the healing within themselves that God wanted for them. The kind of healing that comes from being part of a larger community. What happens then? That's where we get to the parable of repentance. And I'm not going to read this parable to you because I don't like it. It's an ugly parable. Because it says, what if the Pharisees, what if the priests, what if the people that God put in charge aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing? Well, God owns the land that they're living on, according to the parable of the tenants. And he'll pick out those tenants, and he'll bring in new ones that will do his word, that will do his will and spread his word. So, if we're going to churches and we're not finding the word of God there, know this, that God is making room at the table for people that even now, that we here don't expect to see at the table. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know who that's going to be. But I'm excited to find out. Who is God making room for at the table now? Today it's us. Tomorrow, who's next? But I know this, that we always have to have another chair at the table. We always have to be willing to expand that circle and say, I don't know why God is calling this group of people to come meet with us, but I think we have to meet with them today. I think we have to make room for them. And maybe that group, like the tax collectors and prostitutes of Jesus' day, is a group that's repugnant to us, like we are to other groups. Because I went to one church, and they didn't like that I preached, that we are all the same. There's no clergy, there's no laity. We are all priests, and Christ is our high priest. We are all called by God. That was a very threatening message to some churches. While others, they said, no, you're too gay for this church. I was just too unclean for that church. Well, that's why we're here. Because if some find us unclean for one reason, because who we are and another because of what we believe, what group are we going to be making room for next? But I think that if God is seeing that people are not taking the word out, if they're not making room at the table, God's going to make room at his table one way or another. 
I want to be the church that says, no matter who you are, you can serve communion. You can preach God's word. You are acceptable because God has made you holy in his sight. And no matter what I think about you, it doesn't matter. Because what matters is how God sees you. And God sees you as a beloved child. God sees you as the person who will be born for his own purposes. And he has a purpose for each and every one of our lives. And just like Jesus turning over the tables, sometimes he gets to make a big splash. And sometimes it's just right in this little corner. But we all have a purpose in God's church. And if anyone tells you otherwise, just know they might not be at the table tomorrow, so keep coming back. Because God won't ever turn us away. He didn't 2,000 years ago, and he doesn't today. He just keeps adding more chairs to the table. Amen?